My name is Karin Wayne. I'm a genetic counselor at Geisinger and a member of the ClinGen Education Workgroup. This presentation will provide an overview of the current ACMG AMP sequence variant interpretation guidelines and ongoing efforts within ClinGen to further optimize and direct the use of specific evidence criteria for variant interpretation. In 2015, the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics, ACMG, and the Association for Molecular Pathology, AMP, published a joint consensus recommendation for standards and guidelines for the interpretation of sequence variation. The overarching goal of these guidelines, in addition to providing a consistent standard, was to create a framework to determine if a variant within a gene that has a definitive role in a Mendelian disorder is pathogenic for that specific disorder. These guidelines are also intended to reduce the number of variants that are reported as being disease-causing that have insufficient evidence. It's important to note that this framework, as written, is not designed to consider variants in genes with minimal evidence supporting their association to a Mendelian dis disease, which are often referred to as genes of uncertain significance. To accomplish this, the guidelines define 28 criteria that address various types and levels of evidence that either support a pathogenic classification for a given variant, with levels ranging from supporting to very strong, or support a benign classification with supporting, strong, and standalone evidence levels. This figure provides a visual of the different criteria outlined as part of this guideline and how they are grouped into different types of evidence. Evidence is categorized by strength, which is identified by color. The table to the right shows how different combinations of evidence of different strengths are used to, de to determine a classification. For example, a variant can be classified as pathogenic based on one very strong and two moderate criteria being met, or by having two strong criteria being met. A variant can be classified as benign if the standalone minor allele frequency criteria is met, or if two strong benign criteria are met. Now we will focus on general explanations for each specific type of evidence or line in the table above. Additional webinars that provide more depth on the use of these types of evidence for variant inter interpretation are available on the ClinGen YouTube channel. Population data refers to the use of genomic data from large groups of individuals, either patients or controls. Population databases can provide the frequency of an allele or genetic variant in these populations. If case and control populations are available in adequate size, then case control studies can be performed to determine if a variant is present in affected individuals statistically more often than in controls. This is considered strong evidence that a variant is pathogenic, abbreviated as PS4. However, large data sets from the general population, which are often derived from merging multiple smaller cohorts, can inform variant interpretation if a variant is very rare or absent, PM2, or if it is very common or more frequent than we would expect for a particular disorder. The computational and predictive data category refers to the use of computational prediction or in silico models, such as SIFT, Polyphen2, and others, which provide predictions of the likelihood that some types of genetic variants would be disruptive in a resulting protein product. These models are often limited to missense variants, though some models provide predictions about splicing or in-frame deletions as well. Computational predictions are considered to be at the lowest level of strength, supporting. We also make predictions based on our knowledge of the mechanism of disease, associated with a gene and disorder, such as whether haploinsufficiency is the mechanism of disease, and based on which types of variants are more likely to be pathogenic. The PVS1 criterion, which is the only one considered to be very strong, 
can be applied to variants that are predicted to cause loss of function in a gene where loss of function is a known mechanism of disease. Novel nucleotide substitutions that impact amino acid residues, which have been reported previously as pathogenic, are also considered as either moderate or strong criteria, designated above as PM5 and PS1. Functional data typically refers to in vitro or in vivo studies that have characterized the domains, functions, and active properties of gene products, typically proteins. There are many types of functional experiments, and the appropriate approaches depend on the protein and disease. Most of this work is research grade, as opposed to clinically validated assays. The strongest functional data comes from studies of a specific variant, to determine if that particular variant shows a deleterious effect or not, designated as PS3 and BS3. If the functional impact of a particular variant has not been studied, but it is located in a mutational hotspot or well-studied functional domain of a protein that does not also contain benign variation, this is considered moderate evidence, PM1. Population databases are useful to determine the presence of benign variation and are necessary to apply PP2, a supporting criterion which may apply for a missense variant in a gene that does not harbor expected levels of missense variation. Whether a variant segregates with disease in a family is a classic clinical genetics approach to informing variant interpretation. In general, if it does not segregate with disease, this is strong evidence that the variant is benign. If it does segregate with disease, it supports a pathogenic classification. The more segregation data available from multiple family members and from multiple independent families, the stronger the evidence. Of course, we also need to consider the possibility of phenocopies, particularly for diseases that are more common in the general population. If a variant is determined to be de novo, it is considered more likely to be pathogenic. However, this is not enough evidence to conclude pathogenicity alone, since all individuals are expected to harbor small numbers of de novo variants. This evidence is also considered stronger if both paternity and maternity are confirmed. This is most often done clinically through, tri through TRIO analysis for exome or genome sequencing, since the bioinformatic processing of samples also confirms biological relatedness. If paternity and maternity are not confirmed, which is often encountered when parental testing is completed after a variant is identified in the proband, then de novo evidence is considered moderate. Allelic data refers to whether a variant is in cis or trans with a known pathogenic variant. Cis means a variant is on the same gene, hom gene homologue, maternal or paternal, as another variant, and trans means two variants are on different homologues. For a dominant disorder, finding a novel variant in trans with a pathogenic variant is considered supporting evidence that the novel variant is benign particularly for disorders that result in embryonic lethality or very severe phenotypes with biallelic variants. And finding a novel variant in cis with a pathogenic variant, regardless of inheritance type, is also supportive of benign, especially if it has been observed in cis with different pathogenic variants. However, for recessive disorders, identifying a novel variant in trans with a pathogenic variant, if the patient's phenotype makes sense with that disorder, is considered moderate evidence toward pathogenicity. Variants can be deposited in various clinical and research databases, which can differ in terms of active curation, clinical human genetics expertise, and purposes. Searching these databases is an important component of identifying evidence for variant interpretation. 
When the ACMG AMP guidelines were first published, the use of these resources was included at the supporting level. This was intended to allow for internal data or knowledge that couldn't be made available for independent review to be incorporated into variant interpretation. However, using this criteria was problematic and can result in double counting of other types of evidence and other errors. Therefore, currently these criteria are not used by most clinical laboratories and have been recommended for removal. The databases themselves are still helpful if they provide evidence that can be independently evaluated and applied elsewhere in the ACMG AMP framework. Finally, two additional criteria are considered in the other data category. If a variant is identified in a patient who has a confirmed alternative explanation for their phenotype, then the variant is less likely to be causative and this is supportive evidence toward it being benign. Multiple observations of this may be necessary since it is possible for a patient to have two disorders. On the other hand, if a novel variant is identified in a gene that is highly associated with, with a phenotype um, present in the patient or the family history, this is supportive of a pathogenic interpretation. Caution is needed when applying this criterion, however, to avoid ascertainment bias, since many of the clinical indications for genomic testing are not very specific and could be associated with many different genes, such as global developmental delays or autistic features. The ACMG AMP sequence variant interpretation guidelines were clearly intended to be general and the authors recommended future modifications to optimize and refine the framework. Several of the ClinGen clinical domain working groups are actively working toward adapting the ACMG AMP guidelines to make gene disease specific recommendations. This was first achieved for MYH7 associated hereditary cardiomyopathies, which established gene specific population allele frequency cutoffs provided guidance on how to upgrade or downgrade the strength of evidence, defined applicable functional studies, and removed criteria from the original guideline that do not apply to MYH7. Similar recommendations have recently been published for rasopathies, inborn errors of metabolism, hearing loss, and for the P10 and CDH1 genes. Other general optimization efforts have also provided guidance that might be applicable across many disorders or are general improvements. A recent publication in the ClinGen ClinVar Special Edition of Human Mutation specifically provides guidance on how to modify the strength of PVS1 under certain circumstances. As this table shows, it may be appropriate to downgrade the strength of this evidence, depending on how established the mechanism of disease is for a gene disease pair. There are also other variant and gene-specific characteristics which may warrant downgrading PBS1 to strong or moderate evidence. A detailed flowchart of these circumstances is provided in the manuscript. Additionally, other recent publications have described the development of a more quantitative variant interpretation framework that is based on the 2015 ACMG AMP framework, discusses in-depth and disease-focused considerations for the use of population allele frequency data as a standalone criterion for a benign classification, and recommending that the reputable source criteria be removed from the framework. The ClinGen Sequence Variant Interpretation Working Group is also developing recommendations to modify the strength of specific criteria depending on different factors. These tables, which are available on the ClinGen website, provide guidance on increasing or decreasing the strength of de novo evidence for a variant, taking into account whether the de novo status is confirmed or assumed, whether the patient's phenotype is consistent with the disorder, and the number of de novo observations. 
and over time, additional recommendations are expected with respect to other criteria. You can access all of these publications and recommendations on the ClinGen Sequence Variant Interpretation Working Group website. This is an important resource to be aware of as additional ClinGen recommendations for variant interpretation practice become available. I hope this has been a useful introduction to the current ACMG AMP Sequence Variant Interpretation Guidelines and ongoing improvement efforts. Please visit www.clinicalgenome.org for additional educational resources and to learn more about ClinGen initiatives. Our funding sources are listed at the bottom. Please feel free to contact ClinGen by email at clingen at clinicalgenome.org with questions or feedback. Thank you.